Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for being here tonight for our final webinar of the school year. Um, it, we've had this great partnership with Hogue Hospital and their program called Aspire out of Irvine, helping teens and families navigate mental health and wellness. Tonight's subject is technology and social media. And so I will um, hand it over to Dr. Sina Safaya for a presentation. Um, if you have questions during the webinar tonight, you are welcome to put them in the Q&A, and um, we will take some time at the very end to answer those questions and to share more information with you. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Sina. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. I know we all have busy schedules, but this is a particularly important, and actually the timing is perfect because uh, the Surgeon General just released an advisory literally yesterday um, that we're gonna delve into in a little bit. Um, the American Psychologic Association also for the first time in over the decade released parameters and recommendations on how to guide parents, clinicians, and even legislatures on what we need to do to help protect our children. So I definitely appreciate everybody joining us tonight. A quick background, I'm a double board certified child and Alice and adult psychiatrist. I'm originally from Texas. I graduated from UT Medical Branch um, and I came to California to attend residency at UCI and also stayed at UCI for my child and adolescent fellowship. I have a private practice in Newport Beach. I'm on staff at Hogue and Chalk. I've been the medical director since we started the Aspire programs about, I think it's six, seven years ago now at Newport and thankfully we branched out to Irvine including a young adult program that we'll talk about later this evening. Um, I'm also a team doctor for the LA Chargers and an NFL MLB doctor. Um, enough about me. Um, you know, I like this slide right here. Um, it's hard enough being cool in real life. And that was always the case when I was, or at least for me, was the case in, in uh, middle school and high school. Um, but nowadays, I would say these kids are even in under an enormous amount of pressure, way more than we experience as, as older adults. Now they have to maintain not only their real life identity, but now, but now also an online identity. Um, and so I'm glad that we're all here today to discuss this, this subject because it's something that pertains not only to their lives, but to ours as well as, as older adults and what we can do to help protect them and, and their development. Let's look at the facts first when it comes to mental health, at least in the state of California. 12% uh, of our youth, approximately age 12 to 17 in California, reported suffering at least one major depressive episode or another mental health condition in the past year. There's been a 73% increase in hospitalizations. So these are psychiatric hospitalizations um, between 2007 and 2016, and this has only skyrocketed uh, in the last several years, especially because of COVID. Um, Self-harm has also increased at least 51% in the last 14 years. There's been an increase in self-harm visits to the ER. And at least two thirds of our youth in California that had a major depressive episode or suffer with major depression did not receive any mental health treatment, which is, is beyond sad. If you can imagine like the suicide is a, one of the leading causes of death in our, in our young population. And if you can imagine like patients who aren't getting like cancer treatment, like two thirds of them not getting treatment, that would be a complete travesty. This is analogous, this is comparable and in a lot of cases, even more deadly. So it's something that um, needs to be taken seriously. And thankfully the stigma of mental health is improving, but it's still not where it needs to be. Unfortunately, Orange County has, uh, Orange County is a great place to live, but it also has the largest suicide rate um, in terms of the increase uh, in the last, uh, amongst the nation's 20 most populous counties. Um, in the last 20 years, there's been a whopping 45% increase um, and suicides, uh, according to the OC Board of Supervisors. And this is comparable to a 22% increase nationwide in the same time frame. Uh, for teens, a suicide increase has gone up 29% in Orange County versus 22% in the rest of California. And there were more teen suicides in the first three months of 2019 than all of 2018 combined. And remember that this is pre-COVID, so that only skyrocketed uh, over the last three years or so. And you can ask any mental health doctor, actually any doctor uh, that works with the pediatric population. We've been slammed for, for years prior to COVID and it, it only got substantially worse because of the obvious reasons. Um, unfortunately, suicide is the second leading cause of death in Orange County. 
Um, and for each suicide death, there are 10 hospitalizations for attempted suicides. So just the, the completed suicides are just the tip of the iceberg to how many people are suffering. Um, hospitalization admissions have also increased for self-harm, a huge increase since 2009. Um, ages 10 to 14, almost a 200% increase. Um, ages 15 to 19, 62% increase. And in our young adult population, which we call transitional age youth, they've gone, that's gone up 17%. And in my opinion, and many other clinicians, including the Surgeon General and other healthcare providers, we believe that this timing is consistent with the advent of social media and increased smartphone usage. There's been a large spike in suicides and psychiatric, psychiatric hospitalizations around 2000, 2010, 2009 and 10. And that's approximately the same time that 50% of teens had a smartphone. Um, and the timing of Facebook, it was only a few years prior to that. So um, Facebook opened to the public in 2006 and was one of the first social media platforms. And since then, there's been obviously so many others that have, in my opinion, contributed to a lot of despair and, and suffering for a lot of our youth and adults. Some warning signs for depression. Um, I just wanted to mention some of these things just so families are aware and parents and even kids themselves are aware that these things need to be taken seriously. And to me, are analogous to medical emergencies, like analogous to having like a bone sticking out of your leg, like a compound fracture. So anytime a, a child or an adult makes the suicidal threat, especially if it's, a, it's a, with intention or plan, that's considered a medical emergency. And that's called an active suicidal thought or a passive thought or more thoughts of, I wish I wasn't here, I wish I wouldn't wake up, stuff like that. Um, that's still an alarming sign and is a red flag, but the active suicide intent and plan is a medical emergency that needs to be evaluated that same day. I and mean, we'll talk about some different support systems that can help in these kinds of situations by the end of this presentation. Um, if your child is uh, having more morbid or uh, dark themed poems, essays, artwork that refer to death, if you notice a big change in their personality or appearance and their overall um, upkeeping and their and their day to day, what are called activities of daily living, like showering and whatnot, if you notice a big decrease in that, that's something that needs to be taken seriously. If your child has a lot of overwhelming sense of guilt or shame or rejection, if you notice a big change in eating or sleeping patterns. Um, if their academic performance has dropped tremendously, or if you notice any cutting or self-injurious behavior, these are all other red flags that need to be uh, taken seriously and treated by professionals. Um, if a child or even a young adult, older adults are obsessing over death, focusing on giving away their belongings, drafting a will, which is highly unusual for our younger age population, um, or if they're exhibiting any irrational, bizarre behavior, these are all signs and symptoms that need to be addressed either with a pediatrician or other mental health providers like therapists, psychologists, or psychiatrists. Screen screens and more screens. We're going to switch over. We're going to switch gears a little bit to uh, social media, video game addiction. Um, so jumping right in. Um, screen time includes all screens. So that means televisions, gaming consoles, computers, tablets, smartphones. At this point, children in the United States are spending, ages 8 to 18, are spending on an average of seven and a half hours a day on media and technology screens, which is basically a full time job if you think about it in that aspect. And, you know, unfortunately, children who do watch a lot of electronic media, especially those who started at a young age, are likely to have lower grades in school. They read less, they exercise less, they're more likely to be overweight and have future issues when it comes to what's called metabolic syndrome. So things like diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiac disease. And they also sleep a lot less. I have so many patients that come into my office and they're complaining of sleep issues, but then they're on electronics late at night um, and they're wondering why they're having trouble sleeping. And I remind them that the blue light and even the yellow light, some of these kids are really savvy. A lot of them these days are actually savvy. And they'll be like, oh, well, my iOS device, my Apple device has a, um, a function where you can turn off the blue light and it's only yellow light. And I'm like, well, the studies are not showing it's not only blue light, but it's also yellow light as well. Um, any light actually, even the little light in, in your bedroom, let's say like on your TV, for instance, that little LED light has been proven to actually wake your brain up. And so the light goes into your eyeball through your optic nerve, goes directly into this part of your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that's responsible for the hormonal balance between uh, a sleep hormone, I'm sure most of you've heard of melatonin, and then the wakefulness hormones called orexin. 
when you're getting light going into your eyeball, it's literally lowering the production of melatonin and increasing the production of orexin. And so you're actually having a direct physiologic response to having the light hitting your, your face. And you have a lot of kids late at night on their phones or iPads or TVs, and they're in a dark room. And that's even proven to cause eyesight issues in the future as well. So there's multiple reasons why we got to regulate screen time, especially in the evening. Again, sleep hygiene is crucial. As a psychiatrist, sleep is one of the most important things I try to focus on first and foremost with every single patient that walks through the door. Um, a lack of sleep is going to affect your memory. It's going to affect your consolidation of memories and retention. It can affect mood. It can affect the ability to cope, leading to more anxiety and unfortunately some maladaptive coping mechanisms and can definitely impact your immune system. One less hour of sleep per night has been proven to significantly increase the risk of car accidents. And people, I mean, any one of us can technically get a DWI driving while impaired um, for sleeplessness. Now that's hard to prove, but if the officer can prove that you're extremely tired um, and you're failing a field sobriety test because of fatigue, then they could arrest you and charge you with a DWI. Um, another thing that I want to mention real quick is the glymphatic system, which is a recently discovered waste management system in our brains that's been proven to, for the most part, only activate in the evening. So imagine to be a cleaning crew for your brain. If you're not sleeping at night, that cleaning crew isn't coming through and cleaning up all the, 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 the trash and the recycling bins in, in our neighborhoods and our brains. So you can imagine that buildup of gunk, if you want to call it that, leads to significant issues when it comes to memory and all the stuff that I mentioned earlier. And that explains why some of us feel so foggy and have trouble thinking and coping when we're tired. They didn't know what the reason was before in the last couple of years we've discovered this system. Switching gears to gaming addiction. This is a legitimate issue that we're gonna talk about. You know, video games now generate, and this is this figures from about a year ago, so it's probably even gone up from then, at least $140 billion per year in revenue. And that's more than film, music, NFL, MLB, all the top sports leagues, NHL, NHL as well, all these industries combined. 2.4 billion people on this planet play video games every year. And there has been a significant rise in esports as well. Just to give you guys an example, more people watched the League of Legends championship last year than the NBA finals. And there, I, I have kids, multiple kids remind me that there are a handful of e-sports players that are making millions of dollars a year. I remind them that that's few and far between. And if they want to ha have that as a potential um, plan for the future, that's totally fine if they want to go that path. But they also need to have backup plans because to, it's even uh, less likely to make that, that level of money um, with esports even compared to, to different regular sports. Fortnite is a game that I'm sure most of you have heard of. It was designed and created by Epic Games. They have over 250 million players. This company has made billions and billions of dollars. And the way they've done this is by hiring psychologists to utilize what's called intermittent and continuous reinforcement to keep people hooked onto games. And this is the same type of psychologists who help gambling houses and casino houses. Um, so it's similar to like slot machines, the way these, these games are set up. And they also utilize a model called the microtransaction model. This is analogous to drug dealers who will initially give, uh, give their customers drugs for free or at a big discount. And they know that once these users are hooked that they're gonna have a really hard time stopping. And the reason why I'm bringing up the analogy to drug use is because these drugs actually go through the same, sorry, these, the reward system that's utilized by video games is the same that goes through addiction, whether it's gambling addiction, sex addiction, or other types of drugs or alcohol. Um, so we're talking about the same uh, pathways and same brain centers that are affected, which is why some kids and some adults have such a hard time stopping and actually go into withdrawals when video games are taken away cold turkey. Some sobering gaming statistics. More than a half people, half a billion people worldwide playing computer video games are playing at least an hour a day. That's 183 million people in the United States alone. The average young person's racking up to 10,000 hours of gaming by the age of 21. And that's roughly the same as if they were attending all of middle school and high school with perfect attendance. So it's, it's a huge time suck. That's a massive understatement. And unfortunately, there's even 5 million gamers in the United States that are spending more than 40 hours a week playing video games. 
And that's equivalent to a full-time job. Um, except instead of earning an income and providing for themselves and others, actually, in my opinion, forfeiting their futures because a huge majority are not going to benefit playing video games this excessively. And that doesn't mean that I'm against video games. I have a PlayStation 5 myself, but luckily I'm not addicted to these things and I can only play for a short period of time before I get aggravated. And luckily I'm able to set that limit, but I'm also an older adult um, and I don't have time to play these games where kids who are given free reign they're going to potentially take advantage of that and become completely hooked. And um, these are things that are per potentially preventable. So that's why I enjoy giving these lectures because the key in mental health is prevention. And we don't want to wait till the shoe drops and things are completely out of hand before we, we seek out treatment. We want to prevent these things from happening. You know, the World Health Organization not too long ago added gaming addiction as a mental health condition. It's not in our psychiatric Bible, the DSM-5 yet but it will likely be in the next one, then the DSM-6, or if they have a revision before that, that uh, version. But it is right now considered and classified as a condition for further study. Um, and in the future, I'm convinced that they will make it an official diagnosis because just in my own anecdotal evidence working in, in, in my practice, I, I deal with this on a regular basis, almost daily or weekly basis. So it's a, it's a real issue that definitely affects so many people's lives. Um, Many popular games, unfortunately, do emphasize negative things and promote things like murder, killing of people or animals, the use and abuse of drugs and alcohol, criminal behavior, like conduct disorder type behavior, sexual exploitation and violence towards women, uh, reinforcing and pushing racial, sexual and gender stereotypes, foul language, foul language. If any of you have heard some of these kids, typically teenage boys that are on these headsets, some of the language that they use and the way they bully each other is, is horrific. Um, and ultimately, gaming addiction, just like other addictions, is a form of escapism and avoidance. Um, and so that's, it makes sense that kids who are suffering may self-medicate with, with video games. It is more common in male adolescents, although the studies are showing that unfortunately, um, females are also starting to pick up some of the slack. So now it's a 54 to 45% male to female ratio. And video game addiction is more prevalent in Asian countries, um, especially countries like South uh, Korea and Japan, although thankfully they've, they take, they've taken this very seriously and they have the most tech addiction rehab clinics on the planet. Um, the reason why they did that is because there were multiple cases and we, you can look this up online. There were several news reports that multiple young people have literally died playing video games excessively. Typically this was related to either developing a blood clot from sitting down for sometimes 20, 30, 40 hours straight without, st without stopping, without standing, without eating or using the bathroom. Um, and some, some of these kids were even urinating in bottles so they didn't have to stand up. I mean, this, that, if that's not addiction, I don't know what is. But you can imagine some of these kids that do develop these blood clots, they can travel up their body, up to their brains or hearts and either have a stroke or cardiac arrest. And this does occur with young people. Thankfully, it's few and far between, but these are like the catastrophic and worst case scenarios that do occur. It just gives you some example of how profound and debilitating this addiction can be. Um, and my concern is as time goes on with augmented reality and virtual reality already in the mix, like the VR kit that just came out on the PlayStation 5 and now Apple, and I think June 6 or sometime in early June is going to release their new product coming out that's a combination of augmented reality and virtual reality. And so things are going to get hairy, so to speak. And I'm concerned about people self-medicating versus going deep into the escapism and avoidance when they don't want to address their issues in real life. Um, the DSM criteria, real quick, for gaming addiction is repetitive use of internet-based games, often with other players, at least to significant issues with functioning. And that functioning means academic functioning, occupational functioning, social functioning, Five of the following criteria must be met within one year. That includes preoccupation or obsession with internet games, withdrawal symptoms when not playing internet games, a buildup of tolerance analogous to drug use when they've uh, played excessively, um, when they have a hard time stopping or when they go into withdrawals, like I mentioned earlier, if they've lost interest in other activities of their, of their lives, including other hobbies and only fixate and enjoy video games, uh, when people are lying to others um, about their game usage, and then again, when they're using video games to, to self-medicate their anxiety or other symptoms like depression um, as a way to escape or avoid. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics, they recommend the following screen times. For kids younger than 18 months, we want to avoid all of screen media except for the occasional video chatting with loved ones, let's say grandparents that live in a different state, stuff like that. Um, for 18 to 24 month olds, we want to introduce digital media that's only high quality programming that parents are watching with the with the uh, toddlers, basically. And I would try to avoid it as much as possible, maybe a handful of um, shows they can watch per week. Um, two to five years old, we want to limit that screen use to one hour per day. Um, with six years and older, we want to place consistent limits on the time spent using media and ensure that things like sleep, physical activity, and hobbies are prioritized and not affected. We definitely, I, I really like this one. We, we really want to designate media-free times together. So no media use. That means mom and dad too, not using any devices at dinner time or while driving, and hopefully securing some media-free locations at home. So meaning out of the bedrooms. And we'll talk about that towards the end of this presentation about different ways to set that up and different support systems that can help facilitate that. Um, and also having ongoing communication about online citizenship and safety um, that we'll talk about as well. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. How does gaming affect the brain? Um, it activates key regions of the brain's pleasure circuit. And this includes the nucleus accumbens, which is the, the brain's pleasure center, as well as the amygdala, the brain's emotional center, and the orbital frontal cortex. PET scans have revealed that dopamine is released and increased in these centers. And that only reinforces those neural pathways that further accentuates that addiction. Um, these are the similar pathways and responses to drugs and, and other types of addictions, and also can lead to withdrawals as well. And you can also imagine that these kids and adults are getting activated in their minds, but not their bodies. And so there's a disconnect. Um, and that leads to an inability, like a, imagine like a pressure cooker without the vent valve, um, they're going to lash out potentially and take out that aggression on themselves and others. And, you know, our DNA as human beings hasn't evolved much in hundreds of thousands of years. And this technology is all new for all of us. And we're not equipped to handle this, especially with the way we inundate our brains, which is why I'm so thankful that the Surgeon General and the American Psychological Association just this month and yesterday literally are, are sending out recommendations to, again, patients, doctors legislators um, and technology companies to make some legitimate changes and again, protect our children. Gaming effects on functioning. Spending excessive time on games can lead to less socializing with friends and family, reduce social skills because you just have less practice when you're behind a screen all day, every day, lower grades, less reading. Like I mentioned earlier, that affects exercise, it affects sleep and can lead to more aggressive thoughts and behaviors. I would recommend that we avoid video games and preschool age children and parents should be looking at the ratings. Although beyond the rating, I would ask at least one parent to sit down with the kids and watch what, share that experience. What, watch what your kids are playing. So you're kept in the loop. You also want to make a contract and set clear expectations and rules about the game content and playing time. And the key is to enforce these limits. And I mean, these kids deserve respect and, and, uh, support as well obviously and so they need to be told in advance and not like retroactively like after the fact um, we want to make sure that parents and loved ones and adults are monitoring online interactions warning children about the potential dangers of internet contacts meaning like if they're on a video game and talking to some potential predators that can be a, a real problem in some cases i'd like to i put this on all caps and bold and exclamation point no tvs in the bedroom i would say that for everybody every single pay every single uh whether it's adult or kid in the, in the household should not have a tv in the room to me imagine you're a parent that has a huge 80 inch lcd in your room but you're asking your kid not to do the same they're, they're not there's not going to be as much buy-in and so we want to make sure that there's no TVs in the bedroom, no video game systems. Um, if they have a laptop or a computer, hopefully putting that in a public setting. Um, and I do encourage and advise parents to take away iPads and cell phones for children at night. Um, sometimes that can be a very contentious subject. And so it's something that needs to be discussed. But that is a recommendation that, that seems to help most families. Uh, we also want to make sure that video games are incentivized as like a carrot to motivate to do homework and to make sure other activities like chores are done and to make sure that we encourage participation and other activities, especially exercise. Exercise is crucial. 
and is unfortunately underutilized as a legitimate mental health treatment. Switching over to social media. I like the slide because you have four individuals. Hopefully these guys are photographers, but I doubt it. Although the cameras look pretty, pretty fancy, but instead of eating their hot meals or taking pictures, and you notice this all the time, and I've done this every now and then too. And I don't think I've one single time ever gone back and looked at that, looked at the picture of the food. But um, this is something that a lot of us are doing. Unfortunately, we're, we're not actually living our lives. If you go to any concert these days, unless they're not allowed to bring phones in, everyone's literally watching the performance through their screen, which is pretty sad because you could do that at home and you're not actually taking in the, the experience. And so this is something that's becoming very prevalent. Um, and social media is taking over. If you look over at this, uh, this picture on the right, it's the old Marlboro uh, cigarette and you can see the little, uh, little logos are Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And that's because they're just as addictive as nicotine. Unfortunately, 95% of our teens have used social media. Um, I'm not against social media. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of social media, but they are using it excessively. One third are reporting that they're using social media, quote, almost constantly. And 75% do have at least one active social media profile. 40% of children under the age of 13, which is a requirement for almost all the social media platforms, uh, meaning being over the age of 13, it should be that, that starting age. Unfortunately, 50% of kids almost ages 8 to 12 are already on social media. And on average, teens are online almost nine hours a day, and that doesn't even include homework. And unfortunately, these kids are starting young. 96% of children under four have used a device before. 75% of them have their own device. 75% of teens have their own smartphone. In a recent Pew poll, 40% of adolescents self-reported that social media is having a negative effect in their lives. So seems like at least half these kids or almost half these kids are even realizing that these things are negative. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but I've had a lot more patience lately in reading about this online and the literature showing that kids are actually asking for dummy phones, meaning phones that don't have access to social media because they themselves are recognizing how bad it's affecting their own mental health. The U.S. Surgeon General for the first time did release just yesterday, literally 523, uh, on an advisor on social media and youth mental health. It was a 20 page PDF that I will, um, and I, um, I can ask Ryan to send the link over for the PDF for this and the APA uh, advisory that came out this past month. Um, it's a good read, it's not too long, about 20 pages, but these quotes really stood out. Um, there are ample, quote, there are ample indicators that social media can also have a profound risk of harm to the mental health and well being of children and adolescents. Nearly every teenager in America uses social media, and yet we do not have enough evidence to conclude that it is sufficiently safe for them. Our children have become unknowing participants in a decades-long experiment. Our children are literally guinea pigs right now, and these tech companies have taken advantage of this lack of regulation, which I'm hopeful is going to change soon because this free-for-all is not working. Like We're going to talk about the, the different studies in the next few slides that prove that. This isn't my dislike or my like or my opinion. This is science. This is proven with double blind placebo controlled studies. Same to me, I tell these kids it's as evidence-based and scientific as gravity. We can prove this over and over again in multiple studies. Um, and so it's something that I think is, has been disregarded for far too long. I am pleased that this the Surgeon General Advisory did occur, but it should have happened years ago. Like this stuff is pretty obvious at this point. But better late than never, and I'm thankful that we're, we're uh, addressing this head on. Another quote that stood out, frequent social media use may be associated with distinct changes in developing brain and the amygdala that's important for emotional learning and behavior, and the prefrontal cortex that's important for impulse control, emotional regulation, and moderating social behavior, and could increase sensitivity to social rewards and punishments, end quote. And the last quote that really stood out was that there's broad agreement among the scientific community that social media has the potential to both benefit and harm children and adolescents. Social media platforms are often designed to maximize user engagement. So push notifications, autoplay, infinite scrolling that TikTok is a master of. Uh, and by the way, TikTok is a Chinese owned uh, platform. China has their own version of TikTok that's only STEM based, meaning it's focused on science and literature and art. And they're actually not, it's not even analogous to the, the version that we use here. 
Um, the kids in China, from what I remember, are only allowed to use 30 minutes a day, and it's highly regulated. So they're allowing our kids here and around the world to, to have a free for all and free reign. Um, but their own kids, they're, it's like a drug dealer that doesn't let their own uh, kids use their own dope. Um, social media exposure can overstimulate the reward center in the brain. And when stimulation becomes excessive, can trigger pathways comparable to substance and gambling addictions, which I brought up earlier. A national survey of girls aged 11 to 15 showed that 33% of them felt a quote unquote addicted to at least one social media platform. And 50% of teens overall reported it'd be difficult to give up social media. A survey of eighth and 10th graders revealed that they're spending on average of 3.5 hours per day. We're gonna talk about how that's actually over the cutoff of three hours that's been proven in studies that can be detrimental leading to more depression and anxiety. Unfortunately, one in four are spending five plus hours per day on social media. One in seven are spending seven plus hours per day. And one in three are reporting using screens after midnight or even later. There are, are obvious benefits to social media as well. Some of those are staying connected to friends, meeting new friends with shared interests, which are especially important for youth who are often marginalized, including racial, ethnic, and sexual and gender minorities. Um, finding community and support for specific activities, sharing art and music together, exploring and expressing themselves, learning about new ideas, staying in the loop at current events, um, learning technical skills, learning character strengths. You know, I'm, I'm Persian, my, my parents are from Iran, and social media has been so integral in getting out the word into how that, that government is, is terrorizing its own population. Um, and so I have nothing against social media overall, but I also think that things need to be done in moderation. Um, and the key to life is moderation. Even too much water can lead to, to death potentially if you overdo it. That, that typically only happens with, with psychotic patients or schizophrenic patients. Um, but it gives an idea that even water, which is composes most of our bodies and this entire planet, too much of even that can be detrimental to, a, to our lives, um, let alone social media. Some of the potential risks that some of us already know and are pretty obvious are exposure to harmful or inappropriate content like self-harm, eating disorders, sex, drugs, violence, and that includes access to predators. Six out of 10 adolescent girls have six in 10 adolescent girls have reported they've been contacted by a stranger. This can also perpetuate body dissatisfaction and disordered eating behaviors. 46% of teens reported that social media negatively affects their body image, while only 14% said that it makes them feel better. And it, it makes sense why. We'll talk about in the next few slides why that's the case, the different theories that support that. Cyberbullying is a major risk factor for depression and suicide. A lot of kids because of this prefrontal cortex that's not fully developed. They're impulsive, they overshare information. They also don't take privacy concerns as seriously. There's a lot of identity theft, not for their, only the kids, but including their parents as well. There's no doubt that social media can impact sleep, exercise, homework, and other activities. And it's, it's unfortunate that a lot, of, a lot of us these days are seeking validation from strangers online through likes and thumbs up. The four common stresses on social media are the highlight reel. Remember that most people aren't going online and broadcasting like their normal lives. They're broadcasting like the highlights of their lives. And the rest of us that look at that compare our normal day to, for instance, they're like in Switzerland or Italy or just had a new baby or just bought a new car, or just got a promotion or these things are all positive in the grand scheme of things, but it leads to a lot of comparisons and kids are more likely to be vulnerable to that than adults. But I think a lot of a lot of us adults suffer with this too, and that's because we start buying into the social currency. That's like an economy of attention, like the likes and thumbs ups. It's a literal shot of dopamine that reinforces these pleasure circuits in our brains, and it ties up our self worth with what everyone else thinks about us. On top of that, FOMO is a real co concept: the fear of missing out. One of the examples I can think of are some kids who are let's say at a birthday party and not only they not invited, but now they unfortunately have to witness other kids in their class in school having a blast sometimes even being live streamed where they're sitting at home and they were not only not invited but now they have to witness what they're missing out on it's really sad um, and online harassment as well is another big stressor on social media that's a legitimate issue i'm going to breeze through these studies because they can get really detailed 
but there were several landmark studies that came out in the last few years in the world's best journals and the most respected journals. One of those is the Journal of American Medical Association, a study published back in 2019, the pediatric edition. There were 3,800 kids in 31 schools in Montreal. This study revealed that there was a significant between person association that for every hour spent on social media, there was a significant increase in depressive symptoms and even a bigger increase in self-esteem issues. Another study showed that amongst 14 year olds, this study had almost 11,000 kids. This isn't like a study of 10 kids. It's we're talking about 10,000, 11,000 kids found that greater or more social media use predicted poor sleep, online harassment, poor body image, low self-esteem, and higher depressive symptoms, and that was even more pronounced in girls than boys. Another study in the psychiatric version of JAMA just last year revealed, and this was also referenced to in the US General's report just yesterday, suggested that teenagers who spend more than three hours a day on social media face double the risk of developing mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, aggression, and antisocial behavior. This study had 6,600 young teenagers, 12 to 15 years old, that self-reported how much time they had spent on social media. They also factored in uh, different mental health issues in the study and found that three hours of social media correlated with high rates of mental health issues, even after adjusting for a previous history of these issues. And these can be manifested in multiple ways, either internally through dep with depression, anxiety, and externally through sometimes aggressive behaviors, whether it's physical or verbal aggression, or even sometimes antisocial or criminal behaviors. This not only affects our kids, but it affects our adults too, including our young adults. The study published uh, end of 2020 revealed that the more time a non-depressed person spent on social media at the start of the study, the greater the odds that the person will go on to develop depression. That study had 1,300 people between the ages of 18 and 30 and had screened them for depression, factored information like race, sex, income, relationship status, adverse child experiences, and other socioeconomic factors. Six months after collecting data, the researchers found that those who were not depressed at the start of the study became depressed with heavy social media use. Another small randomized controlled trial with college-age youth found that limiting social media use to 30 minutes daily over three weeks led to a significant improvement in depression severity. And this effect was particularly large for those who already had a high baseline levels of depression, meaning that those who already had depression saw a significant decrease, almost 35% decrease in depressive scales um, when they were able to limit their social media use to only 30 minutes, three times a week, so 90 minutes a week. Is there a causal relationship? I believe that there is. There's a couple of theories that explain this. The displacement theory is that the more time that's spent on screens, the less time there is to do other activities. There's only so much time we have throughout the day. And so that it, it adds up, literally. Um, there's also the what I mentioned earlier, FOMO, or the upward social comparison, where everyone's life seems glorious on Facebook and other social media platforms, where we all know that, again, these are highlight reels. Then there's what's called the reinforcement spiral phenomenon which is a hypothesis that social media pigeonholes us to only communicate and be in contact with those who have the same belief system. So we end up all being in a bubble and not having some of these beliefs challenged. That can lead to, unfortunately, uh, more issues over time. The reason why kids are more vulnerable is because they have a, a limited capacity for self-regulation. And so they're gonna tend to have more risky inter internet behavior. Kids who are more risky offline tend to also be more risky online, meaning that they visit more inappropriate sites, they have exposure to social media content that can encourage negative behaviors, they have more issues, there's more incidents of cyberbullying. There's studies that show that 10% of teens have sent per, uh, uh, sex messages, which is like provocative photos or nude photos, um, videos, stuff like that, or, or, uh, or language in that manner and 30% have received. And revenge porn is actually a real issue as well that thankfully, at least in the state of California, has become a, a felony. Um, signs of cyberbullying, if you notice your kids becoming upset after using technology, um, I would definitely take that seriously. If you're, I would take any cyberbullying reports from kids at face value. We don't want to dismiss what they're telling us. We also want to save evidence that needs to be discussed with other parents and school staff. 15% of kids experience cyberbullying 
and 20% experience regular bullying. Um, girls are more likely to damage social relationships and physical bullying. And I wanted to remind parents that sibling bullying is just as dangerous as regular bullying in schools. What's really interesting is that and sad is that 5% of teens actually cyber bully themselves online. And you can imagine this is a form of like self-injurious behavior. It's a form of like cyber cutting where they're hurting themselves, whether it's to get attention from others, um, whether it's to uh, not only get that attention, but in a good way, meaning like getting help, but can also reinforce that negative behavior if they're getting tons of attention from others. Um, we want to bridge this digital gap. Unfortunately, most of us older folks over the age of, I would say, 20, uh, 25, we would be considered digital immigrants. Like we weren't born into this the way our young populations are. They're digital natives. And unfortunately, parents can't often keep pace with the digital landscape. Nearly 70% of parents are now saying it's more difficult to parent than it was 20 years ago. And the top two-sided reasons were technology and social media. Parents got to learn about technology firsthand. I would actually recommend to have kids teach you directly and be savvy enough to make sure that you aren't getting hooked wing because kids are going to potentially leave out different strategies that are going to curtail their use. You also want to talk to other parents so we have like a unified front. We also want to collaborate with schools, which, which, which is why I'm so thankful for school districts like Capital Unified that do take mental health very seriously and thankful majority of school districts are now as well. But it really does take a village. This is going to be a concerted effort with parents with schools, with legislatures, with legislators, and with tech companies. Um, this is not gonna, we can't allow parents and families just to carry this burden on their own. It's just not fair and it's not, it's not the best strategy. Real quick, the digital natives versus digital immigrants. Digital natives are the ones who lack constant connectivity. Again, they were born to this. They prefer immediacy and have a shorter attention span. They go to the internet first for information. They prefer to socialize online more than they do in person. Um, digital immigrants, like some of us older folks, prefer to talk on the phone or in person, prefer formal communication channels such as phone, use de detailed emails or face-to-face -face communication. And some, some prefer printing out things more than working on a screen. Switching gears to advice on what to do with this technology use. Um, when to get a smartphone. There's no magical age. Once a kid is given a smartphone, it'll be very difficult to take it back. You potentially opened up Pandora's box, so to speak. Taking away a smartphone from a 10 year old will often create more problems than waiting to give them a phone a year or two later. The earliest should be, I'd say at least eighth grade, but sometimes even uh, later. And there was a study, well, not a study, there was a campaign in the East Coast that had billboards that said, wait until eight. And some parents thought that meant wait until eight years old instead of wait until eighth grade. And unfortunately, those parents learned the hard way that that campaign was faulty and their eight-year-olds should not have a smartphone. To me, it's like analysis to giving a kid like drugs, or alcohol, or even like a loaded weapon. Um, I would consider a dumb phone, quote unquote, or a flip phone, or even a specialized kid-friendly smartphone, especially for kids who can't regulate themselves or refuse to be regulated by parents. Um, these are devices that the kids can still make calls and texts, and most of them have GPS capability. It allows communication without getting sucked into some of the drama that plays out on social media. And it also allows for, for families to test out the waters before getting into smartphones and seeing if their kids have the maturity and are equipped to handle some of the pitfalls of, of smartphone use. Um, we want to go over the do's and the don'ts. We want to be clear with expectations and limits, and I would even draft contracts like we mentioned earlier, to make sure that these kids do understand um, the rules and regulations they need to follow. Because they need to be reminded that having a phone is not a human right. It's a privilege. Like it didn't come out. The phone did not come with the placenta. It's not a human right. I want to remind parents that you're a parent and kids deserve respect, but they're not on equal footing. This is not a democracy. When it, if it comes down to it and the kid's abusing that privilege, just like as adults, we abuse our, let's say our driver's license privilege, that can get revoked and taken away if we take, if we cross the boundaries too often. And that's analogous to what we need to regulate with our kids. I want to remind parents too, that parents need to be parents and not their kid's best friend. You can be a friend of your child when they're older, when they're adults, but they need parental figures. They need role models. They don't need a 40, 50 year old man or woman to be a friend. Imagine how bizarre it would 
be if your child brought home an older adult and said, hey, mom and dad, this is so-and-so, my, my new friend. It would just freak us out and we'd probably call the police. And the reason why is because it's not appropriate. And I want to remind parents that this doesn't mean we need to be authoritarians and dictators, but we also need to retake control over the situation and remind ourselves as parents that uh, we are in charge and we need to protect these kids. Again, no TVs in the bedroom ever. Firm contracts need to be enforced. We do need to utilize technology to fight technology. And there are apps out there that can be predetermined time limits that can prevent some of the negotiation at nighttime when it comes to getting, getting phones taken away and setting screen limits. Some parent parental control apps, there's one called RPACT, which is the Family Locator and Screen Time Management app. There's one called Bark. By the way, I'm not sponsoring these, but these are, are, um, um, these are control apps that are outside of the native um, iOS and Android apps that can also be beneficial. Bark is a social media monitoring app that connects to 24 platforms. Live360 is a cell phone um, GPS locator, including historical tracking. You can also find iPhone backup extractors that can retext message, including deleted messages can, uh, with call histories, looking over voicemails, notes, and contacts. There's even web watchers where they can log keystrokes. Um, and we're going to talk about the American Academy of Pediatrics Family Media Use Plan as well. Um, that's an interface tool that uh, Dr. Murthy, the Surgeon General, actually recommended as well. And the website is healthychildren.org slash media use plan. This is an interface tool that families can use along with their kids to personalize uh, different things like media time calculators, having screen free zones and times, including device curfews, and also goes over digital citizenship when it comes to having a digital footprint, how posting is permanent, reviewing privacy settings and social media, and also, again, discussing family expectations. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience here. We're going to wrap up this presentation in a few minutes. We're almost done. Um, another uh, a, a good publication source in the New York Times is called The Wirecutter. They're a tech resource. They also recommended that Apple Screen Time is one of the best apps for iOS. I have all my teenage patients go to their settings in their iPhone and turn on screen time so we can analyze and, and assess uh, over time how much screen time they're using. And it can it'll... Uh, delineate like social media versus different apps um, so we can know like exactly how much they're using per day and per week over time. Um, the controls built into the iOS do let you set daily time limits and those are just advancing with each iteration of iOS and along with Android as well. If you do have an Android device, you can also download an app called Custodia with a Q and that can help even further than like the built-in Android uh, limiting software. I want to remind parents again, social media, some social media tips. Um, these executives of these social media companies, they know how addictive these platforms are. They intentionally designed them to be addictive. At the same time, they don't allow their own kids to use these platforms. And I'm not surprised to hear that because they know how detrimental it is. But they don't care, in my opinion, they don't care about other people's kids as much as they, they do as their own. Otherwise, there'd be more rules and regulations that would be self-limiting instead of waiting for the government to catch up. Um, I'd say it's much easier to limit social media use if it's a concerted community and school effort, which again was why I'm so thankful um, to be presenting today to, to hundreds of families, hopefully, and we can try to get that, out this information to as many people as possible, because again, it is gonna take a village. And this is the third time I'm saying this in this presentation, all devices out of the bedroom, especially before bed, I'm reiterating this because it's that consequential. And I would say ideally no social media use before high school. What should parents do? Again, parents got to lead by examples. By example, you can't forbid kids from using technology. It's not a practical approach. It's not tenable. It's technology is here to stay. We got to figure out a way to strike that balancing act. And again, mild usage can be beneficial. Um, we want to make sure that parents need to either mirror their kids' phones or have access to their social media platforms. Um, they need to know their passwords. And if kids don't want to do that, then they might lose that privilege. Um, this is, kids do deserve privacy, but that comes, to, that, that comes with limits. Um, too much privacy can lead to some really catastrophic consequences. And we do want to check on social media, on the DL, on the down low. We want to 
uh, have GPS trackers sometimes without the kid's knowledge, whether it's in the phone or, or in the car, there are different devices that, that can be utilized to make sure you can keep track of your kid. Last but not least, some resources and information. Um, some sources are that we use today are ACAP is the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. They have a great resource called Facts for Families that I would definitely recommend for families to utilize. The American Academy of Pediatrics also has some great resources. JAMA is the journal that I brought up earlier. And these are the two uh, PDF direct links for the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory from yesterday and the APA's May 2023 health advisory this month. And I think I saw Ryan already posted these on the, uh, in the comment section. So I appreciate that, Ryan. Some useful books and websites are Screen Strong is a good website. These are some good books that have been recommended over time. Um, we can take a screenshot of this or um, Ryan can post these in the future as well, um, if you guys are interested. Um, current, some current resources in our community. 211 is a free 24 hour information resource that is a hotline that can also help with health issues as well. NAMI is a great organization um, that can help not only patients, but their families as well. Hope, in my opinion, compared to most hospital systems, is taking mental health very seriously. Um, we're going to talk about how they're doing that in a minute. Excuse me, how we're doing that in a minute. Um, there are suicide hotlines, and the CAT team is a very important phone number that I would have all parents save in their phones. The CAT team is a psychiatric mobile team that's a county based, Orange County based uh, service where mental health providers can come to your home. Let's say your kid, God forbid, um, threatened suicide or does endorse suicidal thoughts, especially if they're endorsing any intention or plan. The CAT team is, at least in most ERs, the same team that will come to the ER. In this situation, they come to your house instead and prevent sitting in the ER for sometimes hours or even days. So I would utilize that resource and save that phone number. They have an 866 number. They also have a 714 number that you, you can look up online. I know I said last but not, not least, but legitimately last but not least, I, I wanted to talk about Aspire um, because Aspire, like I said earlier, I've been director since we opened six, seven years ago. This program was first started in Northern California after there was a horrific uh, trend of suicides that occurred in the Northern California region. And they developed this curriculum that's based on what's called dialectical behavioral therapy, which is one of the few evidence-based therapies that helps reinforce uh, or helps teach resiliency and coping strategies and mechanisms to help prevent what are called maladaptive coping skills, things like cutting, um, whether that's self-injurious behavior, restricting behaviors, so on and so forth. What does Aspire help with? It can help with depression and mood disorders. We can help with anxiety, kids with ADHD, kids on the spectrum, um, kids with personality disorders, obstacle defined disorder and video game addiction. The structure is set up eight weeks, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for uh, 12 hours a week total. Um, patients do check in weekly with team facilitators if necessary. But I want to remind everybody or let everybody know that this is a structured curriculum similar to a classroom setting where kids aren't going over their issues and processing issues. That's more indicated for individual therapy, but they are learning these skills in a small setting, anywhere from six to 10 kids at most um, in the programs. And, you know, as, as the director of this program, I would say, and this, I have evidence that proves this 80, 90% of these kids truly get real benefit out of the program. We know that because they're uh, required to fill out an anon anonymous uh, feedback form once they're done. And the feedback is overwhelmingly positive, which is why I'm so happy and thrilled to be part of this program. And we have a great team and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually very blessed and privileged to, to have such a dedicated and amazing team. And, Anyone that knows me knows that I, I'm very critical and hypercritical. So the fact that I'm saying these things means that I, I firmly believe this. Like the program is very consequential and has been a, a huge help for so many families. We, we treat hundreds of families per year. And the feedback, again, is overwhelmingly positive, which is what fuels our fire and keeps us going. Because um, some of these kids are truly suffering, but watching them and witnessing them improve over, over time. Remember that we're talking about, excuse me, 96 hours of treatment over two months, which is the same as one and a half hours, sorry, one and a half years of weekly treatment with an individual therapist, except we're tackling this head on and kids tend to 
to get better more efficiently. Um, after school obligations are put on hold until the team completes the program and parents are required to attend uh, once a week as well. Thankfully, we're part of the Hope Foundation, which is a, has a massive philanthropic arm and families that aren't covered by insurance can potentially qualify to get the entire program covered for free if they meet a certain uh, economic criteria, a certain income threshold. And for kids who, who do start under insurance, Sometimes the insurance companies, unfortunately, pull the plug on treatment because they don't appreciate the utility of completing the entire eight-week program. To me, this is analogous to pulling the plug on chemo or, or radiation, um, and it's, it's beyond sad. But thankfully, and as far as I know, Hogue is the only pro, um, hospital system in the entire uh, Orange County area that actually will pay for the remainder of the program out of our philanthropic arm if the insurance companies refuse to continue paying, which is awesome. That's one less thing that we need to worry about as clinicians in terms of like calling the insurance company and begging them for, for um, continued days in our program. We were also the first program in Southern California that, that achieved WASC accreditation. WASC is the Western Association of Schools on the West Coast. It's, so we are a legitimate school program, same accreditation, as all the public school systems. So kids who do graduate the program get five hours of elective credit if they're in high school. And that's something that's been a, a great incentive and a carrot to, to get kids to come into the program because they're not quote unquote wasting their time. Um, they're actually getting credit for this in, in high school as well. Some four key points that are addressed by Aspire. These are the four tenets of uh, DBT, our distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, emotional regulation and mindfulness. We have two locations and we have three programs right now. We have one program at Newport Hope for kids 13 to 18. We have two programs at Hope Irvine. Kids, the Aspire program is 13 to 18. And then the young adult program is 18 to 26. And that program started a couple of years ago and it's been very well received as well. Unfortunately, that transitional age youth, that young adult population, the studies are showing they were the most affected of any um, when it came to the COVID restrictions. Um, and so they've truly suffered. And you can imagine an 18, 19 year old going to college for the first time and having to do that online. They, they, they basically missed out on that half of that college experience. Um, so they've truly suffered. That's just one example. Um, but that program has been highly successful as well. And we have a decent, or actually pretty long wait list for, for both that can fluctuate over time. So if you guys call the program, or if a parent's called the program and patient's called the program and they tell you the wait list is, is so-and-so, I would still put your child's name or your own name if you're a young adult um, on the wait list because that, that, list can, that list can fluctuate and we can a lot of times get patients in faster than expected. I wanted to end this presentation on this advertisement a few, from a few years back. We were thankful and very appreciative of the Turner family, John and Kim Turner, who unfortunately lost their, their son, Patrick, a few years back. Um, and they were so gracious and thoughtful to try to prevent this from happening in our communities. And so I want to share this video um, and get their perspective on, on what they think about Aspire and overall mental health. Last year, our son Patrick took his life right here in Newport Beach. He was an incredibly special 16-year-old boy, and he left this world way too soon. Hogue has a teen mental health program called Aspire. Which is helping kids get through the tough times with love and support. If you or someone you know is battling anxiety or depression, call Aspire at Hogue and get help. Patrick told us to make change, and Aspire is doing just that. It could save a life. Okay, and that is the end of our presentation. I appreciate everybody being patient today and hearing us out. And we're David and I are happy to answer any questions. Dr. Cena, thank you. That was great information. I do want to also introduce um, David Cook, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. And we'll just do a few questions. Um, the first one being, being Dr. Cena, that I assume we could share the presentation out as we share the recording out to families. So they have access to all the statistics and the resources. Yes, I'm okay with that. What I can do is I can send you a, a PDF version 
And so they can have a, a printed out copy that's going to be easier to go through than a PowerPoint. Okay. And a lot, and they, I would definitely recommend they, and I believe you, Ryan, already, and I appreciate you posting those two links for the, the U.S. Surgeon General's report and the, um, the APA's recommendations as well. Those are short reads, about 20 pages each, that can be really beneficial. Yeah, we can put both of those in the article we write for the insider. <clears throat> Excellent. So that we can link to those. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I'll, I'll keep this brief so that you can both answer. One of the biggest challenges I know yes, yesterday as executive leaders for the school district, we were looking at the budget and then looking at, at some of the, um, even the concerns and challenges using technology um, as a school district. So we went to one-to-one -one Chromebooks for, um, for students and that was, that was pushed um, a lot during COVID, but honestly, even outside of that, most of the, of the textbooks and the, and the teaching programs we're using now are online. So children have to have access to that throughout the day and then even in some of the work they're doing at night. And so um, I think it's really finding the balance for us at this point of what does screen time look like for schoolwork and for homework and for learning versus social media and that balance. So are, are you seeing the same sort of challenge with the, with the families and the students that you're seeing through the program? And how, how do, what are ways that you recommend that we sort of fix that? Dave, do you want to do you want to jump in? I I did all the talking. I feel bad for doing that. Do you want to? Um, yeah, of course. And I, and yeah, I'll, I, I can a, answer afterwards as well. I think that's a great question. We have um, a lot of kids that obviously spend a lot of time on their Chromebooks, doing schoolwork, uh, and engaging with school activities. But we also find that a lot of their leisure time is spent on social media. It's spent on. Um, I know someone in the comments. I've been reading all the questions that have been coming through. A lot of time on YouTube watching TV and a lot of screens. So I, I do think that the, the best word and the keyword here is balance. I know uh, technology is not going away. I know another question that somebody asked in the chat was uh, related to AI. I definitely think it's important for our kids and youth to work with technology, but finding balance is key. Uh, we encourage a lot of the teens that we work with to notice how much time they're spending, even for leisure um, on these different screen devices. Are they setting aside time to not have any screens or any other sensory input um, while they're relaxing, which which can be difficult. I know we've mentioned a few a few different things related to social media and teens connecting with friends, but we do want to encourage them to spend time with their friends in person to engage in other activities. Um, I think the biggest thing that we see is a decrease in exercise, and unfortunately, it's one of the most beneficial for mental health. Um, so another one of the questions that I'll jump in and address because I think a few of them kind of fall into this category is uh, how do we encourage our teens to engage with other hobbies that are not electronic in nature? And I think as parents, modeling is one of the most helpful things that we can do. So as a family, do we come home and immediately all jump on our screens? Or do we go for family walks in the evening? Do we do activities on the weekend? Are we encouraging our teens to try new hobbies um, and to go out and, and do things in person? Or do we kind of default to allowing them to spend time on the screens because it's convenient. So um, I, I hope that's a good answer to your question. I know it's a pretty broad question, but um, I, I do think it's challenging when a lot of the school material is, is on the computer, grades are accessed through computers, a lot of the work is turned in through computers, um, and then teens want to spend time connecting with friends electronically as well. So I, I do think a balance is really important. Um, I know another question, not to go on too much longer, but asked, would there be more person-to-person uh, -person work in school. And I think you could probably answer that a little bit better than we could, Ryan, but I do like that you guys are thinking about um, just how much time the kids are spent are spending on a screen, even related to school and how it can relate to their mental health. Yeah, that is something that I know that we are working on. And if when we're visiting um, secondary schools, especially you could see that there's there is a little bit more balance. It seems like maybe anecdotally for me, because I've been spending more time there where kids are using computers to access information, but then speaking in, in small groups to sort of process information and, and discuss things. So I know teachers are constantly challenged with technology, with things like AI now, but they're also, they're working, um, 
they're working pretty proactively to figure out how do we how do we work with this in a classroom and monitor it um, a, a, as appropriately as possible. The other thing the school district is doing also um, is we are actually piloting a program that that monitors key, keystrokes for students using Chromebooks and other technology that's accessed through the school district, and um, it, and it monitors specific for specific behaviors and concerns, and then um, and then contacts um, administrators or district leaders in order to look into to more of the history of the use of the Chromebook for specific students and things like that. So. As we move through the, the summer, I know that we'll continue that pilot and then probably look at some things to put in place for the next school year. But parents should know that kids always seem to find a way around filters and other things. So we even saw in what we looked at yesterday that there are students using proxies, which is basically a way to get around a filter to get yeah. to, to content that you can't access through the filter. Um, the only way we know that is because we monitor keystrokes and we so we can see how students are accessing that information. But um, keeping Chromebooks, as Dr. Safaya said several times, out of bedrooms along with all the other technology is key, especially at night. We did see kids are using these devices even in the middle of the night when they should be sleeping. And so that's something important for parents to know. Um, and then I guess one last question for Dr. Safaya and for Dave is that I know you talked briefly about the, the need for infrastructure for mental health. Um, we, we have provided significant investments and will continue to over the next year in what we're doing as a school district, but parents are challenged to find those in the, the same mental health infrastructure outside. Sometimes insurances don't cover it and there doesn't seem to be enough resources. So. Um, is are there any um, like helpful hints or sort of like some hope that you see on the horizon as far as that is that you can share with parents? Oh, I'd love to jump in with this one. So uh, one of my favorite parts about Aspire is that we are pretty much on the ground level in the community. Uh, we get calls from parents, adults, elderly people sometimes seeking resources. And I think one of the most common things we hear from parents is that navigating the mental health system is, is really difficult. There are so many different acronyms. There's so many different levels of treatment, uh, which may or may not be applicable for their teen. Even during COVID, finding a therapist was virtually impossible. It was really difficult. Many people were impacted. Um, I always encourage families and at these presentations, if you ever have a question about mental health or need to be pointed in the right direction, we have a ton of resources that we like to send to families, even if they aren't the right fit for our program. So uh, a, a quick couple resources off the Top of my head, uh, calling insurance is a good one. If you do have insurance, asking for a list of therapists in your area. Um, I like to use that list sometimes and then also cross-reference names and information on a site called psychologytoday.com. Uh, most therapists in the Orange County area have a profile on psychologytoday.com that lists out fees, their specialties, who they work with. Um, so you can also filter on that website and find uh, an individual therapist that specializes in working with teens, you can filter by maybe uh, common things that your teen is struggling with. And then uh, another barrier that we do unfortunately encounter is that a lot of parents will send emails to therapists and not hear back. If you do find that that's the case, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to give us a call at the Newport or the Irvine location. We work with a lot of therapists in the community that do specialize in working with kids and that work really well with parents. Uh, we'd love to point you guys in the right direction and uh, hopefully connect you with resources in the area. A quick Google search of treatment in Orange County does unfortunately pull up uh, in a very exhaustive list and, and some of which aren't even applicable to families and to teenagers. So there is a lot of treatment in the area, but it sometimes can be difficult to wade through and find what's appropriate, what's not appropriate for your teen. Um, again, we, we uh, talk to families all week that end up not coming to our program and that's totally fine. And we uh, are, are more than happy to connect with, uh, with parents in, in the Capo district as well. And, Hopefully, guys. Hopefully, point you in the right direction or give you a list of referrals that, that we've worked with personally. And what's unique? I want to piggyback. I I wholeheartedly agree. Um, one of the unique aspects of Aspire, our program, the way it's run, is that parents will speak to our therapists like Dave directly. And Dave and the other therapists there are very well respected, very well liked, credentialed, 
And like you said, we have tentacles all over this county. Um, our objective isn't to poach patients from other hospital systems. If anything, we just want to be a resource. If we're not a good fit, like you said, we're going to find or hopefully refer you to the right fit program because the objective is to help as many families as possible. Um, and I feel like these types of collaborations only help help that. So, Ryan, it's it's our pleasure to continue this collaboration and try to spread what's called psychoeducation to as many families and school districts as possible. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier, it does take a village and steps like this that we're taking now really do make a difference in, in people's lives. And so we're happy to help as much as we can. Dr. Cena and Dave, I want to thank you for being here. I know I am extremely grateful and um, our school district is, our leadership is, because this informs our work too and what we're doing for kids here. Um, it's been a great partnership and I think this is probably a topic we can talk about again this fall with families. Um, we will work, we did record this, we'll work to get the presentation, the additional resources that Dr. Cena mentioned and um, and the recording of this out to families this weekend. I know one thing that we do at our house is, even if we can't get the kids to sit down and listen to it, we'll turn it on and lo and behold, they're listening from somewhere around us. So they're even picking up the information. It's good for them to have. And um, this, was, this is just very helpful, especially in light of um, sort of the impacts we're seeing from, from the pandemic and other things. So. I just really appreciate your time. And um, I, did I did record the Q&A, so we will work on getting those questions out to families as well. So thank Excellent. you all and have a very good night. Appreciate thank you so much. so much. Have a good evening. Thank you.